How are you? One of the things I enjoy doing is when I get a new cell phone is opening that phone up. It's just kind of its own experience. Um, you know, back in the day when I was younger, new phones were not that big of a deal. I mean, I remember it kind of being a big deal when we went from rotary to push button, you know, <laughs> and when we went from push button to cordless. But even then, it was kind of like just getting a new toaster. I mean, it's not all. But nowadays, it's a different experience. When you get a new phone, it's just like, it's cool. It comes in a cool bag. And just, just pulling it out of the bag is kind of cool. And then, you know, open it up. And there's no dinks and scratches. It's not cracked yet. All the software still works. It looks pretty. I just, it's kind of like, wow, this is cool. And other people are like, wow, look at that. Can I look at your phone? Well, I don't know, man. You're not going to drop it, are you? You know, I mean, it's, you know, and parenting, to me, is a little bit like, having a new phone, you know, when you're, especially if you're a new parent, you get this new baby, you know, it's just like, wow, it's not broken yet. <laughs> it doesn't have all of the problems yet. It's, and I want to make sure everything that goes inside it is pure, you know, and, and, uh, you know, don't do anything to disrupt this perfect child, you know, and, and then after a while, it, you know, the world dings it up and, and, uh, the, it grows up and, you know, you were straining pure foods, and now it's like shoving Taco Bell down its throat. And you're going, <laughs> you know, it's, you know, and you just kind of, have, and, and at first it's like you have all this control, and as time goes on, you realize you have no control. And it's just kind of off doing its, you know, this kid's growing up. That's, parenting is a challenge, and it happens quickly. You know, we don't parent forever. You know, there's, it's a season. When you're a parent, you sign up for a season. It's certainly more than a year. But it's a season, right? And it seems like just the other day, my kids, I was strapping them into a car seat. And then soon they're asking for the car keys. And now we have one that's leaving and he's, you know, giving his keys back, you know, to the house. And this, it's, it's a season. And we need, when we're in that season, to parent the best we can. None of us are perfect parents, but we want to parent the best we can. And, and most of us really aren't trained for that. It's something we learn as we go, right? We learn as we go. And, and maybe we draw from what our parents did, the good, the bad, and all that stuff. And, 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 but God has a plan for us on how to parent. And so if we just parent out of our own limited resources, that's parenting 1.0 is what I'm calling it. But parenting 2.0 means we're going to a whole new software type. We're, we're letting God to help us figure out how to parent. Now, if you're not parenting, if you're not in that season right now, this still is helpful for you because you certainly have kids in your life at some place. Maybe they're neighbor kids. Maybe it's nieces or, or nephews. Uh, we have kids that run around the, ki- the, the, the church and the kids ministry in small groups that you can influence. And so I want everybody taking notes because if you just check out and say, well, that's not my season, you're missing the bigger picture of how God can use you. We, and also this is how God parents us. So it helps us to learn about who God is and how we can relate to other people as well. So let's dive right in. Okay, so parenting 2.0. First thing young people need, there's six things. First thing is that they need compassion. They need compassion. Compassion <clears throat> is love. It's, it's, it's love and understanding. It means I understand you and I still love you. I still like you. I, I, I love you through, you know, and everybody needs that, regardless of the pimples or the warts or the medication that somebody's on, the the various things that dings and cracks in their cell phone, so to speak. And I mean, you love them through that. You just say, you know what, I, I, I still like you. I still want to be around you. First John 4, 7 says, let's read this out loud together. Practice loving each other for love comes from God. Now, circle that word practice. You see, love is something that we learn. Sometimes we think that we just automatically love, but that's actually something we learn. How do you learn it? By practicing it. And there's no better place to practice love than with people you live with. Because those are the people that irritate us so much, right? I mean, they're the ones that don't give us the respect that we deserve. 
you know, we get respect everywhere else. We're out in the marketplace and, and our bit and our, and our, you know, we do a good job in our business or whatever. And we get all this accolades and respect. We go home, we get, it's like gone, you know, they don't care, you know, what, how many degrees you've had, you know, have earned, how, what kind of job you have, you know, you walk in the door, hey, empty the trash. Well, man, I have other people empty the trash. When you're at home, it's a different story, right? Whole different animal. So you love people regardless of, and you're, if you can love them at home, then that's, that's the true test that you have love worked in your life. So you, you, you learn to love because sometimes people at home are the hardest to love. Here's three ways you can love your kids. One is, is affection. Affection where you give them lots of hugs. You, meaningful taking time to hug them and care about them. If they're little, you tickle them. Our kids used to love to be tickled. And that can be a real amazing experience between a parent and a kid. There's also affirmation where they hear it from you. You say, you matter. I love you. You say that to them. Now, for sometimes dads, they, they're broken at that part. They, they don't know how to say that. I mean, they, they do love their kids, but they don't say it. Kids need to hear it. You need to go out of your way and step into that and say, I love you. And it actually might feel a little awkward because your parents never said it. Your dad never said it to you. And so it's just kind of, it's like new clothes, you know. But that clothes will fit well after a while. And you just get used to it. And they need to hear it every day. And then attention, that's where you give them the gift of your ears. You listen to them. If they're little, you squat down, you look at them eye to eye. That says, you are valuable. You are valuable to me. You listen to them. When, when uh, you're in this area of listening to somebody, it's, it's hard to like, you know, quadrant off like 15 minute block. This is the time I'm going to give to your problems. <laughs> Sometimes people need a lot of, you know, a lot of time. And so just listening and listening, tremendous act of patience, not always giving advice, but just listening. It can be very, very valuable and very, very helpful. So they need, young people need compassion. Number two is that young people need counsel. They need direction. They need advice. They need wisdom. They need that stuff. Study after study shows that kids that do well in life, that grow up to succeed, have a stable value system embedded into their life. Stable value system. Where do they get that? Well, from you. If you're a parent, you're the one who brings in that stable. That's counsel. You're directing them to God's word. That's the stable value system. So they, out of that, they make decisions. They view life all from this foundation of having good boundaries, of knowing right and wrong, what to do and what not to do. Sometimes people will say, well, all that matters is that you love them. Well, that's, I can show you cases. I can talk to you, show you a thousand people that love their kids and it didn't help them. I mean, kids need love, but that's not enough. You need more than that. Love by itself is not enough. You need, they need, those kids need counsel. They need wisdom. They need God's perspective on life. They need boundaries. They need a solid, stable value system. And that takes work. And so you, 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 you need it for yourself. And then you model that and you teach it to your kids. The results of not having a stable value system is, for example, is this, there's 750,000 teenage girls. One out of three becomes pregnant every year in America. This is teenagers. Now, uh, this chart here shows that in Virginia, it actually has gotten better here because there's those values being taught, but it's still a problem because if you have 750,000 young girls getting pregnant, there's 750,000 young men helping them get there, right? So I mean, the problem's all around. Teens are waiting longer uh, to, to, to have sex, but it's still a problem. You still have a lot of young girls and young boys that are having sex right out of puberty. They're just, they're just kids. The National Campaign to uh, Prevent Teen Pregnancy, the NCPTP, says that, um, that there's a lot of young girls that, and young boys that are, that are having, that are having sex, 73% of 12 to 14 year olds who lost their virginity say they wish they hadn't, wish they had waited. 58% of sexually experienced 15 to 17 year olds wish they had waited. Judy Kirstensee, uh, the author of Generation Sex said this, quote, 
Often a lack of self-esteem makes kids experiment with sex. She says frequently the result is guilt and shame. As adults, they may punish themselves for their past by not letting themselves enjoy sex. Or they may have trouble establishing meaningful relationships because they've disconnected sex and love. Why? Because there was this lack of self-esteem. There was this lack of values that was embedded into their life. Deuteronomy 6, 7 says, let's read this together. It says, you must teach these commandments to your children and talk about them when they are at home or out for a walk at bedtime or the first thing in the morning. Now, I want you to notice a few things about this first. First thing, it says you must teach these responsibilities. Who else is it? Nobody else. It's you. Sometimes we think, well, I want the government to teach these things. Or I want my school systems to teach these things. They're not going to teach it. They might teach something that is not what you want taught. You know, if you have a view, I mean, the government, as far as they're concerned, they say, you know, yeah, grown men can go into the same bathroom as a young teenage girl or a, a, a little girl, that's all fine. I mean, that's right. That's the discussion that's going on right now. If, you, if you're waiting for the government to set your moral standards, that's the kind of stuff you're going to get. You have to set your own morals. You have to say, well, what does God have to say about, about boundaries and about faithfulness and about things that, that, that all around life that, that we make decisions on? So he says, you make those, he, says, he points to the parents. He says, it's up to you. Then he says, you must. He says, it's not optional. Something that you have to do. You know, if, I know people that are good parents, but they don't take the time to teach these, these moral moorings, values into their kids. And, uh, and, it's, and, it's, and it's their job. And then it says, you must teach. And so he says, we're always teaching, but he says at home, when you take a walk, wherever. In other words, if you're on your smartphone or you're in front of the computer or the TV, even if you're just sitting there, you're teaching your kids something. And little kids, they, they're, they're watching 24-7. How is mom and dad, how are, they, how are they living their life? And you're teaching something through that. And then number, the, the fourth thing I want you to point out, I want to point out is this, you teach these commandments, not suggestions. It's not like, hey, here's 10 suggestions you might want to think about. No, the Bible has 10 commandments and it's not limited to 10. It says, here's the things that I want you to do. This is, this is, these are important. They're things that you needed to, to, to embed into your kids so that they have a strong value system. Now, it can be overwhelming because we do have a society that, doesn't, that has different values than, than biblical values. And so you think, it's, man, it's all up to me, just the parent. Well, you are the primary person responsible, but it, there are other people that come alongside and want to help you. One of those, a key aspect, is the local church. The local church comes alongside and helps parents as they're parenting their kids. It's not our responsibility, but we share, your, we share that with you. We want to come alongside you. We do that in our kids' ministry. You saw Pastor Heather. She does that with our kids, with our teenagers. We have a youth ministry. I asked my, Mariah Oliveira, she's our, our uh, youth director, to just share a few words real quick uh, this past week to you and, about how she can come alongside and help you out. Watch this. Hi, I'm Mariah, and I'm the youth director here at Vineyard. As you are aware, being a high school or middle school student can be very difficult in today's world. Not just the peer pressure struggles from friends that you remember, although that is still present, but staggering challenges with sexual identity and self-image that many times result in some form of harm to themselves or others. Our students face relentless negative influences from both social media and online services. And sadly, parents are often the last ones to even know what their own kid is wrestling with. But the good news is that in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 29, God says that he has a plan for your child to give him or her a hope and a future. And we wanna come alongside you in helping that plan to unfold in their lives. Our Vineyard Church family is here to assist you in your assignment of parenting. We can help. We want to support you by providing a place where you can watch your student grow in their relationship with Jesus. That's why we call our ministry entrance. It's their entrance into the purpose God has destined for them. 
Our goal at Entrance is to help your students build healthy, life-giving relationships through having fun and high-energy music while discovering how the message and power of Jesus Christ can help give them answers that will aid them in navigating through the difficulties they face. It's true, every student deserves to be loved, encouraged, and inspired. So let's do this together. We want to support you, our parents, by investing in your family. And I believe the best is yet to come. Isn't that great to know that you have a local church that wants to come alongside you with this mammoth task of parenting so that you can be successful? And so that's what we want to do. That's the second thing is they really kids, young people, they need counsel. Number three is they need correction because everybody makes mistakes. And so when we make mistakes, when we get off, uh, uh, offline, when we get in a ditch, we need some training. We need accountability. We need discipline, things to get us back in line. Hebrews 10, 6 says, the Lord disciplines those he loves. It's one of the ways that you say you love your kids is when you discipline them. Proverbs 13, 24 says, if you refuse to discipline your child, it proves you don't love them. And then here in Proverbs 19, 18 says, correct your children while there is still hope. Do not let them destroy themselves. In other words, he says, if you don't give correction, if you don't bring discipline, you're actually helping your kids to fail. He says, you're helping them. I know most parents wouldn't look at it that way. They'd go, no, I don't want my kids to fail. Well, if you don't correct, if you don't bring discipline, you're aiding that situation to happen because they're developing poor habits. They're, 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 they're getting uh, bad patterns into their life. And so you bring correction to say, no, no, this is the direction you'd go. Just like you would a little kid who's like running towards the street. You'd run up, no, 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 we're not going to go there. We're going to go this way, right? You're, that's, the street's not the place to hang out and play as a little kid. And so when you bring correction and discipline, that's what you're doing. Now, one of the things that you need to teach your kids when you're disciplining them is two things. I always remind my kids, two things. One, disobedience brings pain, okay? That's, that's true in life. It's the way God designed the world. Disobedience brings pain. And so when they disobey, they get pain. Now, when they're little, usually something a little more concrete helps them to get it. But as they get older, there's different types of way to reinforce that lesson. Disobedience brings pain. Obedience brings freedom. Obedience brings freedom. The more, as we uh, are faithful, as we are obedient, there is more opportunities that come up. We get more, there's more freedom to operate. There's more, we function in more responsibility. All of those things come with obedience. And ultimately, as parents, we want to teach our kids to find Christ. I mean, that should be the number one goal of every parent. Is, is that without coercion, but instruction to help them come to a place where they, they give their lives to Jesus Christ and they get baptized. That's, I pray that every night for my kids, God, even when they were just little infants, I knew that day would come and there would be opportunities all along the way that I would be able to share the message of Christ with them. And they, they did. They, they came to Christ. They, got, they all got water baptized. And that should be your prayer for your kids. Every day until that happens. That's so important. Number four, young people need confidence. They need confidence. Now, it'd be hard to be a kid growing up in today's world because it's harder today than it was in, pre in, in the generation before. And it was harder in the generation before than the generation before that. Things have become more, there's more pressure. There's more stress. There's, uh, there, it's more complicated. It's more dangerous. There's, there's uh, you know, there's just so many different things that are, that, you know, there's more demands on our time. You know, we, I mean, we carry our cell phones with us now. We're 20, you know, and, and a lot of young people, you know, they, that's hard for them to not be, to be disconnected from their cell phone, right? I mean, and they're always connected in and it just, it, there's a lot of influence that comes through all of that. And so it is a challenge. And so sometimes a lot, the world will send out messages that just, Often, they just tear them apart. There's, there's self-confidence. Here's an interesting uh, study educators found through national testing and state testing about self-esteem. They, they, they measured self-esteem of kids, third graders. They found that 85% of third graders had a good self-esteem, 85%. And then by middle school, it had already dropped to 65%. 65% of middle schoolers had a good self-esteem. But by the time they were in high school, senior highs, 
It went down to 5%. Had a good self-esteem about themselves. Because the world just says, you can't do that. You're not good at that. You'll never be this. You'll, and they're just stripping it away, stripping it away. And then they just feel real bad about themselves. And it starts to, they just start thinking, what's the use? It strips away their moral, their, 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 their value system. I mean, the prom is coming up in most of the schools here in this area. Did you know that the prom is the one that more kids lose their virginity on prom night than any other night? And as parents, sometimes parents say, oh, well, you know, that's fine if you're going to go have a party in a hotel room. You know, they rent a room for the night. This is real popular. This is crazy. If you're a parent, you have no business encouraging your kids or, or getting behind that at all. Right? I mean, that's part of, as long as they're in your home, they're part of your responsibility. That's the law. It also makes sense. And so you, you want to you give good counsel and correction and help them with their confidence. Colossians 3.21 says, don't scold your children so much that they become discouraged and quit trying. In other words, you don't want to be an unpleasable parent. They bring home C's, you want B's. They bring home B's, you want A's. They bring home A's, you want straight A's. And, you're, you know, and it's easy to look at your kids and see the things that they're not doing well and then just harp on that and pick on that and nag and strip away and always harassing your kids about things. And in your mind, you're thinking, yeah, well, this will help them be a better person. But actually, it often strips away their confidence. And so you have to, you have to be cautious about that and say, well, I want to be constructive in how I talk to my kids about the things that they need. Uh, they, they, you know, it's not that you ignore it, but you got you to do it in the right way. Confident kids. It says, if you love somebody, you'll always believe in them and always expect the best of them. You see, people, sometimes parents think, well, I'll just give an equal dose of negative, corrective type stuff and positive. But actually, it, shouldn't, it needs to be about, studies show it needs to be 5.5. To one, five, every 5.5, I'm not sure how they figured out the 0. 0.5, but uh, five, about five, let's round it off to five. Five good comments for every one. I mean, it's just the way it is. If somebody comes up to me and says, hey, pastor, that was a good message. And then another person, hey, I like that message. Hey, that was cool. And then another one says, you are way off. That sucked. Which one do you think I remember? <laughs> right? Yeah, I mean, it's just human nature, right? That's just the way it goes. And we're all like that. And so your kids are like that as well. So you need to make sure and give them. It's not one-to-one. -one. It's not like you never give correction, but you make sure and give lots and lots of positive feedback. Number five, young people need celebration. Now, this is just a fancy word for fun. You got to have fun. Now, I know there's a lot of good parents that they protect their kids. They watch over them. They provide for them, but there's no fun. It's just like a to-do list in their home. You know, I'm just checking this off and checking this box off. And they live by this to-do list and, and there lacks fun in the home. A, a home should have fun in it. And that's something that parents need to help bring to the table. Kids naturally like to have fun, but it's the parents that sometimes struggle with that because life is hard and I get it and you're tired and you don't have any energy and you've got, you know, and you're frustrated. But a home needs to have fun. People ought to enjoy every day of their lives, no matter how long they live. When my kids were young, I tried to make sure and have fun, celebrate, have, you know, make sure that it was a place where they enjoyed being, you know, being raised. Our day off was always Monday because we worked the weekends. And, and so we would call Mondays Fun Day Monday. Now, they usually went to school on Monday, so it really was fun day Monday night. But, <laughs> but on Monday night, we'd do something together. And, and uh, in the summer, of course, we'd maybe do something during the day. But we, and we'd just go do, hey, what do you want to do? Go putt-putt or, you know, you know, and we'd just, and not everything was, as the kids got older, they, not everything was fun for all of them. So we would rotate. So it'd be one kid's night and then another kid, you get to decide, another kid, and then the parents would decide. Every five weeks, we'd just kind of rotate around. But you find things to do that are fun. Sometimes I would just, out of nowhere, just in the middle of the night, I would just wake my kids up and say, let's go get, you know, some waffles, you know, or something at, you know, at IHOP or something, or and a waffle house. And, 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 you know, they remember that, you know, and you think, yeah, well, there's homework. Hey, there's always homework, you know. <laughs> what are they going to remember, you know? And so I'm not saying ditch homework. I'm just saying if you do it from time to time, 
It's not going to kill you. But it'll, 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 your kids will remember that. Yeah, that's the day that I remember that. Can you believe that? Dad woke me up in the middle of the night and played a video game with me or made green pancakes or whatever. And you, and you do stuff. One of the goals that, that we've tried to do is, is make sure that not just our home was fun, but that the church was fun. We wanted our kids to love Christ and his church. That's not a given. We wanted, we, so we tried to make sure, and there's a lot of fun things that go on in our church. We, we do harvest parties. We had that egg extravaganza. We've done stuff like that for years. Kids, they would love to do that. We'd have the big inflatables and our kids would be f- just right there ready to do all that stuff. And we do it with them. You know, and sometimes, well, pastor, I want to talk to you. Hold on. You can set up a counseling appointment with me later. I'm playing with my kids right here in church. I'm, I'm just telling you it straight up. You know, I mean, I, that was a priority of mine. I wanted my kids to see church as this is a place to have fun. Sometimes they'd run around the church with their shoes off when they were little. And sometimes we'd have, sometimes we get religious people that sneak in. I don't know how they get in. <laughs> but they find their way in sometimes. They don't stay long usually. But they'd come up, pastor, this is a holy place and your kids have no shoes on. And then I would just tell him, you know, because I know the Bible too. I'd say, well, you know, you know, God actually told Moses to take his shoes off when he was in a holy place. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> They'd scamper off. <laughs> but you make it a fun place. And we took our kids on a missions trip. It's hard work. It's spiritually challenging, but it also was a lot of fun. One of the things that we used to do that was really one of the highlights for our kids was our regional conferences. We've done regional conferences for 20 years. I mean, we just had the first one here two years ago, and we're going to have another one here, but they're usually somewhere else where we go and we go and with, and a lot of you have gone with us. We've had leaders and members and all kinds of people just go and say, let's go do something. Instead of just going to do Disneyland again. I mean, you know, I think in some homes they think, did, did, actually, did you know Mickey? I was reading this for a different sermon um, a couple of weeks ago. Mickey is more well recognized than Jesus Christ. Do you know that when you show it to kids? Well, there's probably a reason for that. Maybe every vacation it's about Mickey and not about Jesus and other things. But we would just say, you know what? Why not take some of our vacation time and go to a regional conference? We've had many, many people do that. And, and our kids loved the regional conferences because we do a lot of stuff with them. And I know that some of you might be not sure about it, thinking, I don't know, this sounds more like a promo piece for the regional conference. So I just, I decided to call, ask one of my kids, say, would you come and just tell everybody a little bit about some of the regional conferences and the fun that you had? Just handpick one or two things just so that they can hear it from the horse's mouth. So Samuel Mead, would you give him a warm welcome? So as Pastor Andy mentioned, he's my father and he's been pastoring longer than I have been alive. So you can trust me when I'm telling you that I've been to more conferences than you will probably ever go to in your life. (laughs) But those conferences, those trips, were more than just conferences. They were adventures with my family. And I wanted to share that with you today. I wanted to share a couple of the memories with you. So I sat down and I was trying to figure out, you know, which ones I would pick to share with you. And I realized I could come up with, you know, I could spend hours telling you about all the things we did. So I decided to narrow it down to just two for you guys. So the first memory I want to tell you about is when I was a small boy. I was about 10 years old. And my family took a trip to Texas for a conference. And I was a little apprehensive because it was going to be just my brothers and I going in, you know, without mom and dad because we would do our kid thing. And we would be with hundreds of other kids we did not know. So I was a little nervous. But right after the first session, that feeling of anxiety was completely gone. And that's because we were dropped off at the first session. And shortly after, we were took part in a mega finger blaster toy war. And you can see they're going to throw up a picture of what the finger blaster toy was. It's a popular 90s kid toy, which is me. And what you did is you used it like a rubber band, and you would launch it at other children. So, <laughs> so really, I saw you some toys. And the eyes, and the and mom and dad weren't there. It was a ton of fun. Me and my brothers had so much fun. We couldn't wait to tell mom and dad about it. But little did we know the fun had just begun. Right after the session, mom and dad, we thought we were going to go back to the hotel, but mom and dad took us out to get ice cream, which to a kid is heaven in a cone. And then they also took us after ice cream to go get our very own finger blasters. Now, I don't know if they thought that went all the way through, 
and they're fighting and shooting each other and I crying and before you got back to the hotel. But they tried. So, but this, it was a great memory. The whole week of the conference kind of followed this format. We would go to an awesome session, my brothers and I, and then we would go do something as a family together, you know, have fun and just do our, our thing as a family. And we had so much fun that we actually stayed another day after the conference was over in Texas to go to this massive water park called Schlitterbahn. And oh, it was amazing. My brother and I loved it. We were running everywhere. They had the biggest, way better than this big monkey down at the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> but you can see that the trip was more than just you know an awesome conference. It was also awesome time spent with family. Really quick, the other story I want to tell you about is fast forward. I was a, a teenager, and uh, we went to Poconos, Pennsylvania, for another great conference. And um, while we were there. Um, we, took some hikes in the mountains through the Poconos Mountains. It was beautiful, saw waterfalls. And uh, I want to point out, though, the fact that I remember this trip and I had a good time with my family and I was a teenager is a testimony in that. So, <laughs> so but some of the, one of the things we did as teenagers was we went paintballing in the deep woods of the Poconos Mountains. And this is my first time ever paintballing, and I, I was hooked right off the bat. I enjoyed it so much that I came back after a uh, session with the other teens and got my dad and a couple of other families who had come with us from this venue to go paintballing also. And we all had so much fun that we brought it back here and went paintballing here in Virginia. And it was amazing. It was a blast. You can see a picture of us right up there. You know, that was the group that just went paintballing here. It was a ton of fun. And part of the reason it was so fun for me personally, um, sharing in a moment, part of the personal fun for me as a teenager was I got to shoot my dad. So for those trips though, you know, it was more than just another conference. You know, it was an opportunity to create memories with my family that would last a lifetime. Yeah. Thanks. So um, I am going to encourage you. Some of you may be on the fence. Maybe you were not even thinking about it. Ah, I don't want to do that. Why not do something that would really significantly invest in your home, in your marriage, in your, with your kids? And he was talking about some of the fun, but there's a lot of decisions that people make for Christ. Not just decisions to put their faith in Christ, but decisions to... Uh, prioritize their life differently and, and see the world differently and be refreshed and be renewed in what God's doing. And that, can, that will happen. That will happen. It's just, will you be part of it or not? So I encourage you to come and, and be part of what we're doing with the regional conference this July, okay? Well, uh, let's uh, go to the last point here. Ready? Uh, young people need challenges. They need challenges. They need uh, uh, things to reveal their talents to expose their spiritual shape, things that stretch them beyond where they're at. And the way that that happens is when we give them responsibility, when we, when we trust them with things, when we give them control. You go, well, yeah, but they might mess it up. They might, if I give them responsibility, they might be irresponsible. Yeah, well, they likely will be. That's part of how they grow in that. That's what you did when you were young and people gave you respons responsibility. Sometimes you messed it up. Sometimes you were irresponsible. But you grow in that. And that's a huge trust thing, especially for parents. Because it, it's just, it's, sometimes it's easier to do it yourself and all those kinds of things. But you, part of the way that we challenge kids and help them to stretch is to give them responsibility. And we help them as they grow from, see, when they're little, it's all parental control. And we want them to grow to self-control, where they can control themselves. But that's not where it ends. For a Christ follower, we will ultimately want them to know that God loves them and has a plan for their life, to figure that plan out, that mission, and to surrender under God's control. That's the process. As parents, Parenting 2.0 is helping them go from parental control to self-control to God control. That's the process. And we, that's, that's our goal. And that happens when we entrust them, when we believe in them. Luke 16 says, whoever can be trusted with a little can also be trusted with a lot. If you can't be trusted with the things that belong to someone else, who will give you the things of your own? 
And so we need to give them uh, this responsibility. Now, some of you might be listening to these six points and, you, and maybe you're parents and you, maybe you're looking back and you're going, hey, I feel bad. I didn't do it this way. Or maybe you're a parent and you're going, this is making me feel frustrated. That is not my purpose at all. That's not my goal. My goal is to say, this is what we are shooting for. None of us are perfect parents. None of us are perfect parents. There's only one person who is ever perfect and that's Jesus Christ. That's why when we follow him, we're gonna get, do better than if we don't. And, and Christ gives us uh, clear teachings from, from, from the Bible where we can say, okay, this is how to do it. And he gives us strength as well. And so it's not about feeling bad and, and saying, you know, because we also don't have perfect kids, let me point out. <laughs> there's no perfect parents, there's no perfect kids. And, and, it's, and it's difficult. But when we, when we rally together, we say, let's do it. Let's, let's, let's uh, try to get this right. It makes all the difference in the world. This last verse, it says, it takes wisdom to have a good family. And it takes understanding to make it strong. And that's our goal, is this to say, let's call upon God's wisdom and his understanding. Okay, let's bow our heads and we'll pray. Lord, I just would pray that you would teach us to be a people of compassion. To have unconditional love. Would you say, no, my love is totally based on their performance. If that's the case, that's, that's not teaching the kids what they need, your kids what they need to know. Say, God, help me to l- learn to love them unconditionally, no matter what they're struggling with what disability they have, what areas where they're deficient in. Help me, Lord, not to focus on that, but to, to learn to see you in this process, to look for the good. You say, God, help me to have counsel, good counsel. Maybe you need good counsel. Maybe you need to be in a small group if you're not in one. Reading God's word regularly, that's good counsel there. Listening to the Holy Spirit. Jesus was raised from the dead, ascended at the right hand of God, and he's here to assist you. Are you praying with your kids regularly? Out loud, where they can hear dad pray. They can hear mom pray. They can't read yet. You're reading them the Bible. Looking for those teachable moments throughout the day. Some of you just need more strength. Say, God, give me the strength when I come in and I'm exhausted, tired, instead of just plopping in front of the television, hiding somewhere. Help me to engage with my kids. This is, if you're a parent, sometimes parents, people come to me and they go, I'm not sure what God's will for me is. And I'll say, well, do you have kids? And if they say, yeah, I have kids at home, I say, that's God's will right now. This is the season. Would you say, God, help me to learn how to correct without condemning. How to discipline without destroying Help me to build their self-esteem, to give positives more than negatives. To have fun in my home. If you want your kids to visit you more than just on Thanksgiving when they leave the home, you better make it a place where they remember this was a place where I had fun. Say, God, help me to To bank it a place where there's fun. And if that's, if you're fun challenged, that's why the church comes alongside and helps you through our regional conference, through other things we do. But don't miss those. We're going to inject fun into your home. We're there to assist you. You say, God, help me to challenge and stretch my kids so they step into the mission you have for them. Now, here's your prayer. Would you say, Jesus Christ, I want to be the kind of parent you want me to be. 
help me with that. Help me to influence this generation of young people, starting with my own kids. Help me to treat them with compassion, build up their confidence, to celebrate their differences and be consistent with them, helping them to build a value system that they can, that will last a lifetime. If you've never invited Christ into your life, this is the place you do that right now. This is the moment where you say yes to Christ. Say, Jesus Christ, come into my life. Help strengthen me. Give me your wisdom. Okay, you make that a prayer. You begin that conversation with him right now. Give me your wisdom. Forgive me for parenting out of my own humanness. Parenting 1.0. Would you say, God, help me to step into a whole new type of parenting where I depend on your guidance and your wisdom. In Jesus' name, amen.